It is quite a privilege uh, looking around the room um, with my full head of hair, thank God, uh, and uh, my youthful exuberance. Um, I'm pleased to say I recognise the privilege of having this space in time with you at such an early stage of my career. And I hope that um, I can offer something of value to you. And I must extend a very particular thank you to Professor Bruce Barraclough for his assistance in helping me pull something together which I hope is uh, useful to all the delegates here today. I always like to start where I intend to end and why say something badly when someone else said it much better than you. Leonard Cohen in his uh, anthem asks us to ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything, but that is how the light gets in. And with that, I hope to establish some kind of cognitive resonance, which will allow us to uh, enter into the topics I hope to cover today. I'll start with a very technical term, brain clunk. My neuroscience professor once declared to my class, the brain is an organ of representation. And he repeated it for effect. The brain is an organ of representation. I'm sure he was already aware of the meaning of this extraordinary statement. But his effect, the effect of his words was immediate on me. Deep secrets from my formative years, images, memories, stories from books, theories of the multiverse, to name a few, all suddenly shuddered and activated as if to shake me. I realised in that moment that these objects, at once unsynchronised and never considered in relationship, through this magical power of my brain to represent the external world around me, actually shaped my sense of selfhood, my identity, the I that is me in the world. A second example of this brain clunk, um, which also resonates strongly with the idea of progression of competence, to use a vastly more meaningful phrase, it occurred during my ethics training. I always had a very ambivalent relationship with ethics right from my earliest days in medical school, and this became personified in a particular professor. And on this day, we were trying to use principalism to divine the moral action of some dilemma or something we were trying to decide. And uh, he only concluded at the end that by turning the whole process into a process, we may actually have already compromised our conclusions. But instead, as the, in the past, uh, of um, experiencing intellectual indignation. Instead, I was shocked because a veil lifted. All ethics, no matter how you construct it, is imminently and indivisibly linked with the people who are talking, arguing, and agreeing their way to some kind of conclusion or decision. It's not a lofty set of abstracted, abstracted ideas, but somehow they're linked. So today, you might have gathered, I hope to take us into a brief relationship with symbols, patterns and meaning, so that we might, in a short amount of time, come to share something of uh, a sense of making of meaning of fit professionals in healthcare. Their importance, their value and the promotion of them in service to health systems and to the citizens. This begins with a disambiguation of what we actually mean by health and care leading to what I hope is a better definition of the roles of the institutions and individuals that make up our healthcare systems. Such a journey requires some intellectual leaps. Uh, I hope you can trust me to land us relatively safely on the other side, but I am an amateur observer, so I hope you forgive me a stumble or two along the way. We will consider the Emperor Hadrian, Hofstadter and Godel, among others, as I try to explore the conflict arising in healthcare when these terms are thoughtlessly combined in their symbols and meaning. If all goes well, we should end up with some idea of how a renewed perspective of this symbolism and meaning functions to inform the actors taking part on what I will come to explain is the fitness landscape of modern healthcare. I'll argue today that if my task was to define the fit professional, it is by its very manifestation a difficult thing to do. For what defines fitness in a rural surgeon in country Victoria versus a physician in a tertiary hospital in metropolitan Melbourne may look and feel quite different. My argument for this position arises from the observation that the context and meaning which defines fitness in each of these cases cannot be formed from a strict adherence to a carbon copy. It requires, as we've heard over and over again today, uh, distinct alterations and adaptations. 
There's almost certainly a shared set of descriptors that might be applied in a comparative sense, but this does not in itself equi uh, this does not in itself equal the definition of the fit professional, because in each context it's not the same. And of course, this is to say nothing of the individuals that actually take on these roles, their qualities, strengths, and vulnerabilities. I'm confident enough to say that I'm in no position today to say this or that is what defines the fit professional. But by the end of the, hope, uh, of the presentation, I hope you'll agree with me somewhat on that statement. T.S. Eliot observed in a, um, pre in a paper he wrote in 1948 towards the definition of culture, a very interesting and relevant uh, feature of the use of the word culture. In general, the word is used in two ways, as a kind of synecdoche when the speaker has in mind one of the elements of what he's talking about, such as art or as a kind of emotional stimulant or anaesthetic. When we bring health and care to mind, we typically experience a pattern of meaning in which the terms are axiomatically linked. In my mind, they're separable objects that for reasons other than the speed of communication, we put together. Our experiential lives of ourselves and our patients provides inexhaustible fodder to prove that that's not necessarily the case. On a recent visit, stories are always good, on a recent visit to an unnamed tertiary referral centre with my um, brother-in-law who'd had a very nasty head strike and developed quite significant meningism including photophobia, stiff neck, well I don't need to describe it for you, um, we discovered that the execution of health priorities can absolutely be delivered without an, a modicum of care. And when he walked out of that emergency department at five o'clock in the morning, he didn't thank anybody. He was left with a very nasty headache after his lumbar puncture, wondering why everyone had been so heartless when he'd been so vulnerable. On the other side, I'm reminded of uh, health and care, of the experience described by uh, Marguerite Yusinar in her quasi-biographical work, The em uh, Memoirs of Hadrian. In his dying days, some 3,000 years ago, suffering from a dropsical heart, Hadrian judges the activity, activities of his personal physician, Hermogenes, who was alarmed in spite of himself at the rapid progress of disease. He concludes that all the magical potions presented to him are of little value, but they had been given with the right intentions of a physician who had put the emperor's needs, and by definition, the citizen's needs before his own. There was so much care, but without manifest improvement in health, or as the idol laments, his death. Now, I didn't hear a hear here or a cheer from the audience when this popped up earlier today. I expected better from my Canadian friends, having travelled there, so hear here, can meds. I'll argue, uh, sorry, you'll be familiar with can meds and the medical expert uh, framework. Not surprisingly to my mind, the domains outlined are a mix of both health and care symbols and patterns. So whilst the consummate expression of the fit professional might be a successful manifestation of the medical expert in all its parts, the framework supports a conclusion that the objects of health and care can occupy different domains of expression. And I've attempted to uh, stylize that with the Venn diagram next to it, where we have the domains of health and care, and I have lifted the facets from um, the different uh, domains as expressed in medical expertise and shown that it can be separated out. And an interesting phenomenon takes place where health and care crosses over, and we'll come back to that uh, shortly. One further foundational conjecture I must make in order to say something successful about the uh, fit professional is my argument that at core there is a conflict of agency between what's called the Ten, Com Ten Commandments syndrome and what Ed Morrows and others have called the last three feet of communication. In my estimation on the whole, caring very much occurs in the domain of the last three feet of communication. It's that interpersonal realm where two humans interact psychologically, emotionally and physically in pursuit of some shared meaning or goal. For my bet, health at least, in its modern iteration, is much more inclined to be understood from an application of an abstracted set of outcomes and outputs, or as I term it, commandments, with math mathematically definable symbols and patterns. Commandmentism in health is found in activities from evidence-based medicine to treatment protocols to four-hour emergency department goals. Much like health, what constitutes the fit, to pr fit professional also tends towards commandmentism. If indeed all that was required to ensure our fitness was a comprehensive list of do's and don'ts, and we've established, it's not particularly effective. 
And I wouldn't need to be here because the 30 years of research that precede me would have given us all the answers that we need. I'm actually going to truncate any further review of this aspect of fitness because I don't believe it will bear much fruit beyond what is already established dogma. Get your own GP, take your holidays, exercise, and my very favourite, develop a work-life balance. I believe our best path is much greater appreciation of the context of the fit professional in their environment and in relationship to their patients. The Ten Commandments was an early tradition attempting social organisation around a set of indisputable truths. They were indisputable because they were from God. What's my favourite? The fifth. Anyone remember what the fifth commandment is? Oh, God, a bunch of heathens. I was brung up Catholic. I know what the fifth is. Thou shalt not kill. What a nice sentence. It's a declarative sentence that an eight or nine-year-old can understand and, more importantly, can apply. Thank God for lawyers. No, it's OK. Oh, we've got an eminent one in the audience somewhere. Without whom this simple statement could not have evolved into the thousand-fold mitigations, rationalisations, degrees and punishments. How is it possible that self-evident truth should so readily twist and turn? Well, my answer is twofold. Firstly, there is no divine truth. And by that, I mean an indisputable set of laws that functions at all levels and layers of the universe. Secondly, at a social level, we might find the possibility of distilling a seemingly, set, a seemingly inalienable set of truths. But at the far grainier level of the interpersonal, any truth falls foul of the ethicist's observation, it all depends. It's not because there's some untruth about our commandment. It's because in the interpersonal domain, a new dimension of meaning making emerges. In the sense of the patient-doctor relationship, to quote Paul Komisaroff, who's an eminent ethicist here in Melbourne, the relationship occurs in a region of the infinite array of infinitesimal events that make up the interpersonal encounter. A helpful analogy to why commandmentism isn't necessarily uh, going to save us, but why it is also very important, is established in Douglas Hofstadter's work on consciousness and the mathematical theory of Godel's incompleteness. I'm not going to paraphrase the work, um, so I rely in part on your faith that I'm not selectively quoting. But for the purposes of this argument, I'm drawing on aspects of his thesis relating to self-referencing within organic systems and the emergence of consciousness. He shows that by generating iteration after iteration of loops of logical building blocks, and we might consider that neuronal networks, they can become sufficiently complex to allow an awareness of self to arise, and that this is only possible when the rules that govern the loops are incomplete. The image on the left, taken from Citizen Kane, is a great example of how you can experience an infinite loop in your own life. Just stand between two mirrors and you get this effect. On the other side, we've got the drawing by M.C. Escher of his hands drawing each other. This is equivalent to what is called the chicken and egg paradox. How can one hand be drawing the other hand when it requires a hand in the first instance to be drawn? This incompleteness causes a paradox, and paradoxes are powerful. Under these circumstances, a new level of meaning making is required to resolve the problem. This pressure to find new levels of generating understanding is fundamental in, to the effectiveness of fitness landscapes, which I'll shortly describe. But just like our mathematical friends, I sense there's a preference to try and build a foundation for the organisation of healthcare from a set of indisputable axioms. This is the Ten Commandments syndrome, the tendency to attempt to codify at macro scales a set of truths that must be observed by individual players down there on their fitness landscape. I've observed at the interpersonal level that one can actually honour the symbolism of a commandment but produce decisions as a function of caring that are equally truthful but in contradiction to the intention of the commandment. And that's a paradox I hope to resolve later. But why does care matter? And how is it manifested? Well, thankfully, we don't need to look much further than CanMeds again. In their preamble, the group states that fundamentally CanMeds is, is an initiative to improve patient care. Care is not a secondary or tertiary outcome, it's the primary outcome. Why? Why not aspire to fundamental improvement in health metrics by whatever means necessary? Surely with enough expenditure, expenditure and research, we could codify all the essential processes to bring health outcomes within normal, definable goals of the population. 
Or are we saying that improved health, patient, health, patient, sorry, patient health metrics is equivalent to improved care? If you listen to the vast majority of uh, conversations on busy hospital rounds, you'd be forgiven for having formed the view that health metrics is a fundamental ambition of treating teams. But our learned peers have endorsed care as the primary outcome. So are these objects equivalent, synonymous, paradoxical, or something else? Hadrian, in true Roman logic, resolved that the virtue of care expressed by his longtime physician forgives all manner of futile treatments. As a result of this care, he even wishes to avoid homogenies the embarrassment of the emperor's own suicide by seeking a death potion from another doctor. In short, care is necessarily about the interpersonal, the professional in relationship to the patient. And I'm not giving much away, and we've heard plenty of evidence already today, that collectively, at present, in the estimation of our patients, we stink somewhat in their estimation of our care, despite the fact that we don't appear, in my view, to be any worse at executing health improvements. We don't need to look much further than the opinion pages of the local newspapers as a result of the uh, Victorian nurses' strike, where all manner of other complaints are being raised on those pages. I said earlier that care is fundamentally about the professional in relationship to the patient. I suspect our troubles to date reflect the least good choice of measuring what care looks like, how it's experienced, who's responsible for it, and the impact of this on its relationship to outcomes. Secondly, I'll argue that care as a concept itself is now its own synecdoche. It's an overinterpreted concept whose meaning and application are too indistinct to make it truly understandable. It would be wonderful if there was a black box of care that did in fact reflect the success of a health system and its practitioners. And I'm by no means arguing against the need for care, far from it. My challenge is to its current formulation and role in systemic quality management. It's troublesome because it influences our understanding and measurement of fitness of our professionals. If we return to CAN meds, we see the ultimate cri outcome criterion is improved patient care. In my estimation, this is the rub. If there are a couple fundamentals of the human experience, it's that it's usually vague, relatively unconscious, and even fickle. And all of that's at the best of times. Patients can be self-centred, greedy for time and attention, and unrealistic to, unrealistically demanding of uh, our expertise. So how can a whole system of organisation be measured in its, in its success against the individual, profoundly complex experience of singular patients when such conditions prevail? Hopefully, in this uh, last section of my presentation, I'll pull together some of these arguments and threads to establish the context and role and value of fit professionals in the life of the health system and the care of our patients. I'll undertake the effort by div dividing my thinking along the lines of the players who take part on the fitness landscape, which you'll see shortly. That's government and bureaucracy, the learned colleges, medical education, and finally, the clinical encounter. Here's a fitness landscape. This one's describing the fitness landscape or in a computational model of a theoretical gene A versus a theoretical gene B. It's relatively self-explanatory and it's not simplifying the concept. Each strand of red running in each direction is some element or expression of that gene and its influence on the population who sit below the curves. Or as we can see near gene B in low fitness actually uh, suck populations down. In traditional Westminster systems, there's a preference for separation of procurement and delivery in order to create checks and balances to promote, among other things, value for money and accountability. In Australia, we're on the threshold of a major reorganisation of our funding arrangements, and it's well beyond the scope of my talk to talk about that. And I think most of you would have some very valuable insights from your own experience into the importance of resourcing by bureaucracies to maintain workable systems of health and care. But again, that's a debate for another time. In the theme of my presentation, I'd like to venture that no matter where funding arises, it's not in the bureaucracy's best interests to involve itself in the individual lives of its citizens. When this done, it does happen, we can be fairly confident 50% of the people, give or take a few, are going to be happy, and 50%, give or take a few, aren't going to be happy. 
Instead, I propose that a government will benefit maximally within health systems by focusing mainly on its strengths. That's redistribution, redistribution and coordination of resources, purchasing power to drive efficiencies and support innovation, and lower order gatekeeping of community level interests in professional standards and accreditation. It's not an exhaustive list, but it does set out what I hope are a set of boundaries within this fitness landscape. So going back to our diagram, the edges of our diagram are not abstracted edges. They represent a boundary established by the organisation of the systems playing on that uh, landscape. It's my contention that governments and bureaucracies function best at the axiomatic level, the commandment level, and that they can shape the landscape by the judicious use of axioms generating higher order change within smaller units of the system. But there is a distinct and necessary limit to how deeply they can reach into those smaller units of activity. Except in extreme circumstances, the value of inter intervention, for example, in the practicing life of, a, of an individual practitioner is grossly outweighed by the consumption of resources that might have been better distributed elsewhere. I repeat, in the extremes of circumstances, there's a role for that. An example of bureaucratic reach that's generating much debate at the moment is this four-hour emergency room department, uh, department um, target. The time scale four hours is distinctly within the operating limits of the interpersonal, and it's being used to measure aspects of larger system efficiency and value for money. The jury remains out somewhat on the overall value of four-hour rules, and I'm not here to argue for or against it. But I am attempting to offer insight into how governments might best exert their boundary building influences across the landscape. In general, when the boundaries are clear, consistent and within right limits, the individual actors, whether they're local area health networks or individual practitioners, can create, create a much better detailed map of the landscape in which they're operating and in fact adjust their activities accordingly. The manner in which that adjustment occurs can be both positive and negative. The directionality of change is powerfully linked to a range of factors which we've heard some of today, including punishment and reward systems. These exert an enormous amount of pressure in different locations across the landscape. No one really believes that a bureaucracy can possibly understand their individual circumstances, and governments shouldn't be so arrogant to think that they do, but they do have power to shape the directionality of change because of their larger organisational influences. If we turn our minds to the learned colleges, because of their location closer to the highest order activity of clinical encounter and their administrative responsibilities as gatekeepers of the membership, the task of the college can be quite complex. They have a dual role across health and care. This includes embodiment of the principles of scientific method as keepers of the profession's standards, which are intimately linked, as CanMeds has already established, with individual practitioner performance and the domain of care. I can only echo the words of the Honourable Geoffrey Davies, who in his oration at uh, the Queensland Scientific Division's uh, meeting last year, implored the colleges to take greater responsibility for restoring the trust of patients in their practitioners. This was especially following the Patel Affair. In the main, this is achievable via collegiate activity promoting professionalism. And I'm not going to say any more about professionalism other than it's a handyism, because it describes at the interpersonal level where health and care objects suddenly meet and interface. Colleges are publicly and privately aware of extraordinary details of their fellows' performances, but all too often they invoke this there but for the grace of God go I. It's a platitude, and I think it's probably from a misplaced sense of mateship rather than peerage. Nothing provokes the ire of the observer than to hear after the event that somebody knew something was up. It smacks of protectionism and nepotism. If a college accepts its translational role and takes the so-called axiomatic rules of bureaucracy and government and interprets them for the higher order meaning they bring, they have the capacity to bridge the gap. They can influence bureauc uh, bureaucratic priorities and promote fit professionals. As an example, this alignment makes colleges capable of, of identifying peers at risk rather than having to wait or react to allegations of boundary transgressions identified by bureaucracies, where the standard is uh, often quite a distance from where we might like it to be in ordinary operating terms. 
It's actually best that the peers take charge of the at-risk colleague because we're willing, they're much better placed to understand the local needs and vulnerabilities of the practitioner involved. Colleges do have a role in formulating axiomatic rules that inform the boundary of fitness of their fellows. In a nutshell, it's a keystone of professionalism. Who else but our peers truly has the necessary breadth and depth of insight to properly outline what constitutes the medical expert and, by extension, the manifestation of the fit professional? Unfortunately, I must observe that too often this results in the approach reminiscent of our 20th century mathematicians. It's an erroneous attempt to describe a complete standard of operation for the fit professional. We've got Godel to thank in another discipline for dispelling that myth. No college has an umpire present in every room and every clinical encounter, but figuratively speaking, they're just outside the door. Being closer to the granularity of everyday practice, they exert tremendous and valuable influence. Here I'm reminded of uh, Professor Jerry Hickson detailing work from the Vanderbilt Healthcare Group in the US, where they have an amazing performance management process for the thousands of practitioners under their network. Far from peers identified at risk, becoming obstreperous and resistant to change, in the face of good data presented by their peers, most are compelled to improve their performance. And I trust there's, a, there's other examples out there and they've been alluded to today. Um, turning our minds to medical education, I've got to admit a special interest here, particularly its role in professionalism and the fit professional. In effect, and I'm glad to hear it uh, reiterated in other ways today, any opportunity for colleagues to interface professionally is in my mind an opportunity for education. I am decidedly in favour of apprenticeship models of training because when they're designed around dialogic learning, and that's there for you to digest um, as I speak, they're capable of powerful cultural and behavioural change. And I'd argue that a thoughtful mix of competency-based training and apprenticeship titrated across the developmental trajectory of our doctors is likely to generate the fittest professionals. But why? Medical education in an apprenticeship model and a relationship is to all in intents and purposes just one degree of separation from that highest order activity in healthcare of the clinical encounter. This position potentiates its value immeasurably. The fullest sensual engagement of the learner is activated. The brain draws such enormous amounts of information from its representing of the external world from the central processes. It's little wonder that as a learning medium, it's the most profound. Tied to that, and you'll see the, um, the image moving, I've come to appreciate with the little experience I have had working with patients and peers, I've only been out for nearly just on 10 years, um, learning is best achieved with what is known in other literature as self-referencing. This is subtly different from the concept of reflective learning, which is a catchphrase of modern medical curricula. Self-referencing is action-based. It's reflexivity, uh, to use the other parlance. And it requires the presence of another, generally with greater insight into the context of the practitioner in the system in which they work, the student begins to identify from the contextualising of the peer a sense of self in the fitness landscape, and it's analogous to our Cartesian model here. Initially, the trainee might start out with a two-dimensional sense of their position in space and time. But with time, we can develop, under these circumstances, a much deeper and more dynamic experience of where we sit in the fitness landscape. Ultimately, the outcome of this awareness raising process ought to be a professional who is continuously undertaking a rigorous examination of their motives and a more exacting truthfulness across the spectrum of their professional activities. So Liam challenged us right at the beginning of today to think about all of the stuff we're talking about in the context of why I get up in the morning or why any of us as clinicians might get up in the morning. And in my anecdotal experience with the few thousand doctors I've met over the last six years and the work that I've done, it's this. This is what gets a clinician out of bed in the morning, the clinical encounter. I've several times contended that the highest order meaning of action for the fit professional is located in the clinical encounter, Murrow's last three feet of communication. Indeed, I consider this space with reverence and I can't hope to say anything vaguely useful about the fit professional without some words dedicated to this. It is the subtlest, most fragile, and prone to chaos. 
where all the systemic levels around it and the distinctions between health and, health and care blur. It's also a place of great strength, where all the bewildering and conflicting pieces of information, motivations, unconscious projections, fears, vulnerabilities, and resiliences of the patient and the doctor have their opportunity for resolution. In my view, and I declare myself a dilettante phenomenologist at heart, this highest order of meaning making is precisely the reason our definition of health and care blurs, making them synonymous. It's not because we're lazy or thoughtless, it's because in our experiential world, our most intimate encounter with the symbols and meaning of health and care occur in this space, which we then clumsily put together under the rubric healthcare. In the clinical encounter, it's often been in the face of my science being its most futile, that a deep commitment beyond what I can do affected the greatest benefit for patients. In these encounters, I learned something of the strength and vulnerabilities of my own performance boundaries. So by necessity, I learned something about my fitness as a professional. And I don't believe I'm alone in that type of learning. In fact, a professor who reviewed my um, talk today commented that if we consider the clini clinical encounter in reference to ev evidence-based medicine, the fit professional can be called upon to dissent if necessary from the dogma of the evidence and use their intellect and experience to allow them to arrive at a conclusion which is right for the patient, but might be, might be quite different from the inherited wisdom. This is an awesome responsibility, and it's part of the privilege of service in medicine, in my view. My performance in the clinical encounter is not usually consciously shaped by the laws and hospital policies around, say, open disclosure but I'm sure it influences me. It's not because of the words written down in the good, uh, Guide to Good Medical Practice that I act sensitively towards grieving relatives, but I know on reflection those words have shaped my formal learning environments. The careful consideration of resource allocation in the face of a gravely ill patient, um, which is demanded of me by the health bureaucracy, is not necessarily in the front of my mind, but it must be influencing decision-making at some point. I hope you can see that the fit professional, by the very necessity of engaging on the fitness landscape of healthcare, must essentially, if by degrees, engage with all the agencies on that landscape. And the fittest professionals are, in my opinion, those who engage most consciously with the reality of this in the clinical encounter. And I've shown a performance boundary here because I don't really have one in medicine. You may all have them in your own local colleges, but I took this one from the United Nations Environment Program. And what they do each year is they publish a set of uh, diagrams which visually describe where we sit in relation to pre prescribed boundaries which form the concentric circles. And we can see, for example, here, it's nicely demonstrated, that in biodiversity, we're profoundly outside even the outer limits of what would be consider considered uh, safe boundaries for our planet's um, sustainability. There, that must translate at uh, some level into our healthcare environment. The most vulnerable actor on the fitness landscape is invariably the patient. The power of the fit professional is their capacity to transform that potential energy of the healthcare system into kinetic service of the patient. But in any energetic system, entropy abounds. And it's usually the most vulnerable part of the system that is most affected first. This is the second role of professionalism. When we enact health and care, we simultaneously must be conscious to defend the patient from the inevitable tendencies to disorder. We know from great research to date what many of the ingredients required are to achieve acceptable performance boundaries in our professionals. One of the continued impediments to achieving greater penetration of these ingredients is an overdetermined over concept of health and care. The symbols and patterns of meaning are too blurred and inefficiently combined in a way that renders both less effective. If we disambiguate health and care, we might more accurately impute a fundamental scientific principle called downward causality. And I'll explain. If the world was presented to us purely at the level of the cellular biochemical, we'd develop very good ideas about mitochondria, proteins and enzymes. But we may never realise the organisation is taking part in a cellular structure as an organ, or that that organ occurs in a lion versus a dove versus a human. We miss what's upwards. 
However, from the level of personness, as we have experienced as a species, we've had great success in moving in the other direction, which is the downward causal. Given that we can't clone fit professionals, we must use our downward causality powers to understand, understand some of the generalizable rules that might shape the environment in ways that promote fitness in individuals. And here's the strength of bureaucracies and colleges if they are capable of diligent interpretation. We can make inferences and analogies from the complexity of the individual clinical encounter over time to promote generalizations that influence lower order systems. And this nesting of complexity within complexity is not new in healthcare. And in fact, Professor James Reason and many others have shown uh, its value and its necessity in our understanding when we think about risk and risk trajectories. What I'm challenging us to strive for is a far clunkier, brain clunkier, kind of engagement between all the actors at play on our healthcare uh, landscape. If we don't have experiential aha moments on a regular basis, we can be sure that in the last three feet of communication, that concentrated moment where all the layers condense, the ultimate outcome criterion of the medical expertise, patient, uh, improved patient care, might be missed. It's not a call for perfection, as Leonard Cohen notes, but also as Winnicott in my own tradition has noted, good enough medicine is good enough. The fit professional is consummate in their understanding of regulations, protocols and procedures from bureaucracies and other organisations, but it's not dogmatic. The fit professional understands the role of peers, medical education and public institutions in defining the fitness landscape of their practice, but never forgets the primacy of the clinical encounter. They create for themselves the capacity to respond adaptively to change in their environment, avoiding the cardinal sign of nearly all psychological maladies, rigidity. They cultivate self-referential patterns of behaviour and relationships that allow them to identify early any threats to their performance boundaries when there's still time for compensation and restorative action. We're not enslaved to our axioms, but we allow them to filter into the clinical encounter thoughtfully, consciously, and rigorously. Health and care are not synonymous, but intuitively, and I do go as far to say manifestly, they are intimately related. In the end, it is about the actors engaged in the clinical encounter doing their best to build a common meaning from which a shared set of goals might be arrived at. And the doctor in this encounter is the interpreter of health and its experience in the care relationship. I'm drawn to conclude that the joy and privilege I've discovered in my work so far is being responsible for, responsible for bringing both health and care to my patients. Sometimes it's a little bit more of one than the other. Um, this may be as a result of the dynamics of the relationship I'm in or because of the pressures exerted from me from the external environment. I can say that I was once an angry trainee, railing against the system being the reason I found so little time to care for my patients. Over the years, I've realised that in the working environment, there are cracks in time and space where care can take even the smallest route. Reflection and self-referential learning allows me to cultivate those fragile shoots, such that most of the time, and we've got to remember, we're not all perfect, at the moment where care seems its most hopeless, in the face of the tasks demanded by my science, I take a breath or two and manage to find the cracks. Thank you.